as long as there's been photography, people with cameras have been gazing into the dark, bringing us images of crime, of murder, and of death. The evidence witnessed in these photographs are true still lives, frozen for eternity. The lens is as ruthless as the bad guys. It doesn't flinch from bloodshed. It can detect. It can indict. It can deter. And it can shame. The camera cannot lie, or so we say. That's the principle behind the work of the policeman with a camera, the evidence photographer they call him. He documents the crime scene, the corpse in its position, the spent bullets, and after an arrest is made, the police also photograph the criminal. But when we take a photograph, we put an edge round one set of facts and exclude others. Every picture can be changed by the way it's framed, by the choice of lighting, by the choice of lens, by the choice of angle. The camera cannot lie, but it can be highly selective, an accessory to untruths. I'm Harold Evans, innocent until proven guilty. The crime photographer goes where we never want to go, sees what we never want to see. In the police department of Newark, New Jersey, the crime scene unit responds to over 1,700 calls a year. The archive is a grim repository, a record of human cruelty. How can somebody do this? That's the question. How can somebody do this? You always find yourself asking that question. There's no answer. Crime scene headquarters. 1117 Broad Street. Hi. In forensic photography, you can be expected to take a photograph of anything. The photos are the only way that we can bring the jury back to the crime scene so that they can also see what our eyes saw and what our observations were. It's very graphic and gory sometimes, but a photograph takes away the ambiguities. It puts the same image in front of a large group of people at the same time, as opposed to a subjective verbal explanation of what you saw. In terms of deciding a case, what is most persuasive is not scientific testimony, testimony of witnesses, but pictures, because the pictures in that image capture the story. I'm sure a lot of jurors really are haunted by these images. Basically, all we need is photos inside the bar. He didn't touch anything other than he placed a gun to the back of one of the victim's head. Any evidence out there to be photographed, any evidence out there to be recovered, collected, and submitted as evidence, that's what I do. The photographer walks into a crime scene before anybody else has touched anything, before anything has been moved, and covers the scene as completely as possible. No! Don't do that! Don't do that! You can't go there! It's a privileged entry walking over the police barrier. It's like you've lifted up the corner of the sheet and you're looking. I don't think everybody got gripped to see what I see. Sometimes I get about 10 jobs a day. Shootings, robberies, stolen cars. Big city to cover. 47 square miles. This is what we had so far this year. Majority of these are shootings. The application of photography in law enforcement is probably the most varied that you would ever run into. You basically have to be prepared for whatever environment you walk into. Channel 5 for now, Channel 5. So we're going to start putting this uniform on. I'm prepared just to see anything. I can still see you, man. You might as well just come on down. My first crime scene was a, a DOA. And it was in a warm weather. So I looked, oh my goodness. And it's like, well, we need you to take pictures of her. I said, okay, I am taking pictures of her. So I was way over there like with that file camera. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking pictures from like a hundred yards away, y'all. Uh, and it was like, 
<laughs> but we needed to get close. I said, no, I can see her from right here. <laughs> but now I, I'm just like, I'm just used to it now. So I can be anywhere you want me to be. You got one shot at it. There's no time frame on it. Once you we establish a crime scene, you keep that crime scene forever. This guy shot in the chest. His car shot up too. When I get on the scene, my detective will give me a walkthrough of his body. It's a 35 caliber casing right there. Some of them are plain visible view. He just opened up on his house. Everything happened so quick. The guy got shot right in the spot right here. And this is what all the evidence leads to. I write everything down for my report. Several bullet holes through driver's side windows and doors. We take measurements of the scene. Number four, 61 feet, eight and a half inches. It's a very precise job that I have. Once you've left the scene, it's like walking over a bridge and burning. It's a one-shot deal. You can't go back. I tell you, it's, it's one of the hardest units to work in because it's, that's what you work with is that you got to kind of like build up a wall, so to speak, where it doesn't affect you because you literally would probably go crazy. You know, seeing death all around you all the time. It's, it's not a good, it's not a good sign. You work your work instead of letting the work work you. Whenever you're close to the dark side of human nature, you're channeling through yourself a lot of experiences that are are dangerous. Sometimes you just gotta look, but don't look. Especially like a child's look. I guess that's something that no one can like get used to. I tell you, I tell you, it's very different with a child. Well, whenever we look at a picture of death, we feel threatened. You're in the same room as this dead person. You see up close what death looks like, and you can almost feel what death feels like. And certainly it doesn't take a lot of mental gymnastics to translate that to your own condition and to realize that as they are, so shall you be. I go on somebody's jobs down. You make sure that never happened to me. It happens every day. It happens all over. Without the photograph, we can't understand the true nature of crime. We can't truly appreciate what the law enforcers have to contend with. Without the camera's scrupulous eye for detail, many more crimes would go unresolved. Somewhere, these crucial pictures have been taken right now. A lot of people believe they don't become what I see. The smiling man in this picture is a killer. The photographer is his victim. We will examine the myth of the criminal face when shots in the dark continue. every crime there's a criminal. What kind of person robs, assaults and kills? In the old dime store thrillers we read that the villain's eyes were closely set or he had a lowered brow or simian features. It's a shock, deeply troubling to our sense of security 
when we see a photo of a serial killer, a Ted Bundy, say, and find we are looking at an apparently normal, even attractive person. Does the face of a criminal give anything away at all? In the 19th century study of physiognomy, eyes, ears, noses and mouths weren't just physical characteristics. They were seen as mirrors into the soul or character of an individual. In this view, there's a normal face and one which suggests evil. If any person looks different, than a, quote, normal person. It's someone with disease. It's someone who's deformed. It's the whole concept of the other, the person you fear, the criminal, the insane, the degenerate. Large eyes and delicate brows do not figure among the requirements for being a criminal. They were the traits of the working class. They were the beetle brows and the prognathous jaws. And it's the same current that eventually led to one aspect of Nazism, ethology. Noble people look like eagles. Ignoble people look like swine. While the criminal face is an illusion, the criminal character is all too real. The crime photograph is simply the culminating image of factors beyond the reach of law enforcement. A lot of kids raised up in bad homes, and their child doesn't know the difference between right or wrong. They're going to do whatever their parents are doing. If their parents are doing drugs, their kids are going to grow up knowing all about how to sell drugs, how to use drugs. We all like a nice villain. We have to have a villain. It's the yin and yang. We have to have somebody evil to feel good about ourselves. And whenever you're perceiving an image, you're putting yourself, you're putting your own projections into that image. Criminals mostly escape into darkness, but some of them long for the light of fame. They want to make celebrities of themselves, and the camera's their conspirator. The handsome, smiling man in this picture is not a victim. He's a killer. George Sveck. The person who took the photograph is his victim. Sveck liked having his picture taken by people who befriended him as he hitchhiked across the country. His habit was to beg for a ride, pose for a snapshot en route, then sometime later return the generosity by visiting the home of the transient benefactor where he would strangle the man's wife. Zweck confessed to robbing and assaulting 16 women this way. Of course, it was foolish of him to have himself photographed by so many who could identify him. He paid for his vanity by going to the electric chair in Sing Sing. The problem with the criminal is not the man who commits the first crime, who steals the loaf of bread, but recidivism. The guy who's going to come back and commit crime after crime after crime. How do you identify these people? In 1865, wanted posters first incorporated photos of the criminal. Today, everyone who gets arrested gets their photo taken. The mugshot. But when someone is arrested the first time, there's no way to know whether they'll be a career criminal or famous for something else. Mugshots are fascinating. Of course, they've proven to be one of the most enduring forms of portraiture. You're allowed to photograph a person from the front and from the side, or sometimes it's done with a mirror so it's in the same shot. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Frenchman Alphonse Bétillon sought to supplant photographs of likenesses with measurements. He used steel calipers and compasses to measure heads, ears, hands, fingers, 11 physical attributes in all. He calculated that the probability of two people having precisely the same measurements was 4 million to 1. Since a photograph could change and a person's appearance could change, Bertillon 
realized that bony length does not. He tried to take the mass of people and individualize them. By the time you got done with his pictures, by the time you got done with his analysis, you really knew the person. In 1903, the limitations of the Betion system were exposed. This is Will West. This is William West. Two men serving time at Leavenworth Prison. Neither Betion's measurements or photography could tell the difference between them. A few years later, the British police force started using a much more reliable identification system, fingerprinting, in which the odds against two people having precisely the same print are 67 billion to one. He said he was wearing gloves, right? Yeah. What type of gloves were they wearing? Yeah, you ask him. gloves? Like gloves? This is a commercial robbery. Fingerprint job. Did they give a, a height description? I don't concern myself of what the burglar touched while he was in your home. Just want to know how he got in and how he got out. Because you're going to leave evidence when you come in. And you're going to leave evidence when you come out. Everybody's friend is different. Even twins. That's your whole identity. Now I got to go put all of this on paper. No matter how precise the process is, crime photography has one enemy, prejudice. In the summer of 1994, two of America's leading news magazines hit newsstands with the same picture, but not quite. Time took the cop's mugshot of O.J. Simpson, scanned it into a computer, and darkened his skin. The myth of the criminal face endures. Next, the great tabloid photographer Ouija knew just where to get that memorable shot. Who are the Ouija's of today? And how far will they go for a picture? Turn on the nightly news almost anywhere and you will see images of crime. But before television, our perceptions were mainly filtered by the tabloid newspapers. Sing Sing Prison. In the American imagination, it means death row. On January the 12th, 1928, Ruth Snyder made her way down this hallway to be strapped into the infamous electric chair for murdering her husband while he slept. Newspaper reporters, but not cameramen, were allowed at the execution. Tom Howard pretended to be a writer, but he was a daily news photographer, and he smuggled in a tiny camera strapped to his ankle. A cable ran up his trouser leg so he could work the shutter from his pocket. He got the first picture of an electrocution, and of a woman, no less. The photograph was splashed on the cover of the next morning's paper, and the daily news was denounced. The readers, however, voted with their two cents. Half a million extra copies were snatched up. Circulation soared as the public's appetite for images of crime grew. By 1935, the entire life and death of notorious gangster Dutch Schultz could be seen as a series of tabloid photos. On October the 23rd, 1935, rival gangsters gunned him down at dinner in Newark's Palace Chop House. 
Schultz was repeatedly photographed as he lingered in the hospital for 22 hours, slowly dying. There's a certain way in which newspapers, by the use of headlines and sensational photographs, could whip up public frenzy. It's a business. The news business is business. Today, there's still tremendous pressure on tabloid photographers to get that front page photo. Some of my best jobs were 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. That's when you get fatalities. Most of the photographers are given specific assignments. There are a few who listen to police radios and just are, are out in the street patrolling. You're always on a job. Like a cop carries his, some guys carrying a gun. And I always carry a Crime photography draws us into a world we dare not enter. We're glad we're seeing it through the eyes of someone else. In the 30s and 40s, they were the eyes of Arthur Felly, who seemed to have the psyche power always to be at the crime scene. So he called himself Ouija, after the Ouija board. He had what they used to call a nose for the news. He had an instinct about what would make a good picture, where he should go. To him, it wasn't just a job, it was some kind of calling. When he's photographing people who are in trouble, people whose relatives have just been killed, you can see an identification between him and the tragedy that he chose to make his living from. Ouija became the first photographer to be allowed to have a shortwave radio that would pick up the police band. And he would be in his car, so he would be able to just zip right over and be the first on the scene. photographers out there, the competition's fierce to get that picture and then get it into the paper. Plan B. You're constantly looking for weaknesses. She's <laughs> landing us up on the bridge now. That was such a nice shot from there. Well, if it was your choice, maybe you think about it. I wanted these guys to be mellow first. Once they you start talking to them, make them feel comfortable, I think they're angry at you. Lousy shot. It's good up on the ramp. You got kicked off. Sometimes you just gotta bide your time. Look around, survey the land, see what's there. Then you figure out what you're gonna do. Nice and easy in case they're still up there. They're down. Come on. Some people hunt with a gun. Me, I, I've always hunted with a camera. Hunting for criminals, hunting for stories. 
concrete jungle. It's just a matter of being patient. But on a video lens, you can get the shots. Please. The ghost of Ouija's in me. Filming everything, sooner or later we end up filming crime. Yeah, I remember it. Now that I see it, I remember it. I wouldn't have remembered it if I hadn't seen the tape. The reason I bought it was to film my wife and my family and that kind of stuff and Christmas. And it was a new camera and we were just filming anything. I still missed the beginning of the event because I had to wake up, realize something was going on, go get the camera, get out there. It's, it's rare that you'll see the beginning of it.
started drowning. My instinct was to run in, grab and you know help her, and, and and another guy came as well, and we pulled her out. But if I'd been there with a camera, I may not have done that. I always want to do that. Predict the next photo. Predict the story. I, I feel like I have a sixth sense about these things. You feel like something's going to happen. A certain amount of ESP involved there. And I do believe in that stuff. Just a matter of the right placement at the right time. You can be on the other side of the world from a job. You're just not going to make it. Hi, it's Todd. Did you hear that gas explosion? I I'm going to head towards that. All right, sounds like a top four. And he's 21st Street. Good for A fire is a fire, you know, for the most part. When you're looking at the paper, do you want to look at a picture of flames coming out of a window, or do you want to see a little girl in her nightgown holding a teddy bear looking up at her house? I mean, you think of a million different scenarios that people relate to. Like, oh, that could be me. You can take an event and, and you have to humanize it somehow.
look at the images in your head. Say, Paddy Hurst and bank robbery. But how much can we trust images like this as true? Most of us have etched in our minds Patty alone with gun, as if she's holding up the bank all by herself. But that's a cropped picture. The original full surveillance photo of the scene tells a rather different story. If she makes a false move, she's exposed to gunfire from her kidnappers. We all like to think that photos don't lie, that pictures are worth a thousand words and then some. But pictures, like words, are edited. They're an edited view of reality. And what's not in the picture is often as important as what's in the picture. Hi, it's Todd. Yeah, they had some guy with a knife uh, in the criminal court here. Uh, going nuts. Uh, no, he was threatening to kill himself right in the lobby of the criminal court. I'll let you know. In public spaces, everyone is subject to the waiting eye of the camera, documenting our actions, innocent or guilty. Who's my man? supposed to presume people are guilty just because they've been arrested because you're only accused of a crime at that point you are not actually convicted of a crime. Now, a little, for a second there I got a little afraid I didn't know what he was gonna do you know he, he looked like he's gonna break loops right got enough action we would like to, to have a world that uh, doesn't have danger in it We'd like to be able to move freely and not be thinking about surveillance. Everybody's watching you. Everybody's watching you. Even though somebody who's going to rob you is watching you. I said, well, you were alert enough to know somebody watching you. Video surveillance cameras are everywhere these days, patiently waiting to catch a crime in the act. We're glad they're there to catch or deter crime, or are we? They're in stores. They're on public buildings. Really, just about everywhere you can think of. They're all over. It's this idea of the preventive measure that, well, if crime hasn't taken place here yet, it, it, it's bound to pretty soon, and we'll be there ready for it. Let's not bother with pictures after the fact. Let's have our pictures before the fact. We have access to very high-tech cameras, low-tech cameras. There are cameras on helicopters that are very powerful. People have to be careful and aware of all the ramifications of living in a state of surveillance. You know, it's a big, it's a big price to pay for the occasional, you know, success that we would all agree would be a success. Every spot in our cities is a potential scene of a crime. London's Metropolitan Police Service were on the hunt to find a man who was planting nail bombs in a sports bag that he'd leave in crowded areas. The police reviewed thousands of hours of closed circuit television tape. They spotted a pinprick image of a man carrying a sports bag similar to the one seen before the bomb went off. Then they found an image of the same man without the back. Enhancements were released to the press. One of his co-workers identified the nail bomber and the third bomb was his last. An empty city street anywhere has been walked down by hundreds of millions of people over the course of years. If a murder didn't take place right in the spot where you're standing, then it was only within 20 feet either direction. It, it's just the concentration of humanity. There's another one on the corner somewhere around there. That's all we got, man, is liquor stores. <laughs> it, ain't gonna hard, it ain't being hard to find a liquor store. Around here, you know, right. you know, here they have that warning sign in places are 
being recorded. We have two cameras here. That's that's also not connected. Uh-huh. It's just the front. They'll spend large amounts of money for this equipment, but yet they won't go buy a, the tape to go in it. And the tapes are real cheap. Yeah, I mean, Someone just photographed this. Certainly law enforcement needs enhanced tools to be able to be more efficient and more effective. Technology is not a panacea for society's ills. No, sir. Video surveillance is not going to give us the right picture of what's going on so that we can prevent crime from happening. The law doesn't provide privacy to any of us in public spaces. When we lose our feeling of security and privacy, we've lost a lot. We've lost, really, our freedom. Someone is watching you. Millions of miles of footage are being made by hidden cameras. They'll catch a criminal in the act now and then, or a victim hurrying to a last fatal appointment. Is privacy a cheap price to pay for peace of mind about criminals? Or will it make paranoids of us all? When we return, for over a century, crime photography has evolved along with technology. But will our thinking keep up with our tools? Right now, at this very moment, a crime is being committed somewhere. And it will be invisible, a deed in the dark void, unless a camera enables us to contemplate the crime, the perpetrator, and the victim. The circumstances of death must be documented. But photographs also provide crucial evidence of the circumstances of life. Yeah, you're just in time. Good timing. The overwhelming virtue of what might otherwise be a shaming voyeurism is that we are forced to reflect on our impulses, our insecurities, on the sufferings of others who might so easily be us. The photography of crime is a subject of brutal simplicities and infinite perplexities. I don't talk about the job when I'm off. When I'm off, I'm off. <laughs> I'll leave it here. A lot of the stuff I see is sad. You know, I want to bring something sad home. Whenever I walk out that door, I'm just like totally different. You won't never know what I do. We admire those who have to deal with the pornography of violence. But there's excitement too at our entry into a dark, secret world. And guilt. Guilt that we are looking at all, at once repelled and drawn in by a fretful curiosity. Crime traumatizes us. 
so much that we will go on searching for more and more reliable means of identifying and convicting those who do us harm. A hundred years ago, Alphonse Bertillon measured faces physically. Now we measure them electronically. It's called face track, a computerized system of biometric surveillance that was tried out at Super Bowl 35. The faces of every one of the 75,000 spectators were scanned as they entered the stadium. 126 distinct facial features were registered on computers. The measured faces were then checked against state and federal files of known troublemakers. 19 positive IDs were made. There were no arrests this time. But it's clearly an astounding tool to stop crime before it happens. We are on the eve of the day when every moment in our lives is evidence. The unspeakable demon aroused by crime photography is this, that it might so easily be me or you who is caught as the subject in the lens. We are willing observers now, but in the unknowable future, we might become unwilling participants ourselves.